Thanks again for joining us on the show, TMI Monday. And once again, uh, Happy New Year 2023. <coughs> I'll go straight to review some of the major events that uh, took place in uh, 2022 and then make our projections for 2023. Of course, so we'll be going political this morning because the uh, 2023 election is just around the corner. I'd like to thank our panelists uh, in the studio. Mr. Daniel Igile is an APC chieftain from EGO, as well as a public affairs commentator. Thank you for joining us, Dan. Good morning, viewers. Thank you so much for having me. We also have with us in the studio Christopher Ojekere. Christopher Ojekere is also a PDP chieftain, a public affairs commentator. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you. Good morning. Okay. Um, it looks like uh, for the better part of 2022, the major talking point is the 2023 election. Uh, let's look at the political parties look at the electorates and look at the candidates that have emerged look at INEC in terms of their actions and inactions preparatory for the elections in 2022 what's your assessment let me begin with you dan uh, firstly i'd like to say happy new year to viewers out there and uh, i'm happy that we we are in 2023 we expect that 2023 will be a better year much more than it we had in 2022. uh in 2022 we saw primaries from across all the various political parties and party flag, flag bearers emerged across all the various political parties and campaign was swinging to, into gear, even if it had not been into full gear, but it has started. People have started having, you know, discussion. And in 2022, we saw for the very first time general our party a lot of persons are dissatisfied with the political class. And then we saw again for the first time a third party, a third political party with a, a political flag bearer that a lot of persons are, you know, tending to talk about. It's a, a discussion that is novel on our political scene. We're having a, we used to have a domina, the, the dominance of the APC and PDP. And now we have Labour. And then it makes better, makes the political scene, the political level better because now the voters would have cause to assess and discuss and look at the flag bearers, the ones that will be best for this country, Nigeria. This is again the backdrop of the fact that in 2022, we, we, we saw for the first time a change completely, having risen from COVID-19, COVID that changed the face of the earth. And then we saw a lot of apathies, a lot of uh, myriad of events that took place that we could actually look back and say, we thank God for what has happened. OK. God uh, Chris, uh, yeah. talk to us about some of these uh, uh, key things that uh, happened in the build up to the 2023 election. Which of them struck you the most? Well, um, I think the participation, citizens' participation and interests in the political processes struck me the most. And the reason why I think that was going on was because people can't wait for 2023 to have a change of government. Uh, politics, people have suddenly realized that everything that you do, whether it's education, whether it's your tactics, whether whatever you do is affected by the government in power and the activities, policies, and programs of that government. So in 2022, when people realized that it was just one year to go before we enter into 23, where we're going to have a change of governance or a change of government, people became very interested and they are still interested today. They are, uh, the interest is heightened. And the reason is simple. Uh, you have a government in place that this nation has never passed through and will never pass through again by the grace of God, the kind of melancholous situation we have passed through in 2022. We have what you may refer to as a general feeling of annoying. You know, uh, we've never experienced this kind of economic miasma. We've never experienced this grand scale of corruption. We have never experienced this grand scale of insecurity. We have never experienced this grand scale of academic you know, uh, derailment, and everything is in grand scale and they are all negative. So people can't wait because we are hoping, there's a, there's a gut feeling 
that we never have this kind of situation again in Nigeria. It's a season of anomaly, as Walesha Nka would put it, and we want to get that past us, you know, uh, behind us as soon as and as fast as possible. So what struck me most is people's participation and interest. If this interest is sustained until the election, we're going to see real changes, you know, in, in the national politics. Now, uh, other things, uh, other, the, another institution I would like to give kudos to is INEC. If you check the electoral reforms and all the, of the electoral acts, all the acts, all the reforms that were done in the act, INEC has not completed about the inability to meet any of them. Whether it is giving the timetable of election a year to the election, whether it is budget, whether it is personnel, rather it is the society we are to blame, who have for certain reasons, especially in the South, is taking to burning down INEC <coughs> offices and trying themselves to derail the election. And that's done by a section of uh, the country who we feel you have people there who feel that they have nothing to benefit from the states called Nigeria. And so there's no reason why we should have an election. Okay. There's no reason why we should have a transition. So that's why it's happening in that corner of the, the which is the Southeast. But if not, INEC as an institution, I mean, if you go out now to collect your voter's card, you will sometimes, you won't spend up to 15, 10 minutes. Your voter's card <coughs> is there and you are given. So they've been trying to live up to their billing to ensure <coughs> that the 2023 election comes and is done smoothly. So all of that has been very impressive for 2022. Okay. All right. Uh, now, let, let's quickly uh, look at some of the uh, key issues that are coming to the front burner in the build up to the 2023 election, because that seems to be a major activity, if not the only major activity that uh, is attracting a lot of attention globally. Um, we've seen all the reactions that are trailing certain issues that are coming forth. Uh, but what's your take in terms of the key issues that will shape the election arising from some of these things that we have seen in 2022? Well, uh my opinion is the issues that would shape the elections, I would wish that voters would look at the pedigrees of the various flag bearers. The flag bearers all have a pedigree, to, thanks to, thanks to their, their, their various political parties that brought them out. For instance, um, uh, Atiku Abaka was the former vice president of this country. And Peter Obi was the former governor of, of uh, Anambra State. And Asiko, Atiku, I'm sorry, Asiwa Jubala Ahmed Tinubu was the former governor of Lagos State. They all have pedigrees. And I believe that what should shape the, the voters' opinion about them is what are the pedigrees? What are the things they did while they were in office? They had eight years. Atiku was eight years vice president. Uh, Obi was eight years governor of, of, of uh, Anambra State, and Asiwa Jubala Ahmed Tunubu was eight years governor of Lagos State. What are the things that were monumental, that were placed on ground? What are the things that the, the, the state benefited? What did Nigeria benefit from Atiku? What are the things that are laudable, that Nigerians will look at and say, why is Atiku was vice president, he did X, Y, and Z, and they will say kudos to him? What are the things that Obi did while he was governor of Anambra State. And then the Anambra people would say kudos to him. Those are the things. And then Asiwaju, uh, Asiwaju Bola Metinubu, what did he do to Lagos? When he came, Lagos was just coming out from, I mean, Nigeria was coming out from a, 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 military, a military regime, and then we had nothing on ground. The, nothing on ground. There was no face. It was shapeless. It was void. And then Asiwaju had to shape his own. What did he do? How did he shape Lagos? What, when he left Lagos, what did Lagos become? And then when uh, 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 Obi came, when he left Anambra, what are the people of Anambra State saying about Peter Obi as of today? And then what are Nigerians saying about uh, 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 Vice President? Those are the things that should shape the mind of the people. Because if you want to look at the political parties, the political parties, you cannot say the ruling party have performed or they did not perform because there was a global meltdown. It was quite unfortunate that the, the ruling party were ruling parties at the time that would have the Prime Minister of Britain resigning after just a few days in office. And then it, it's quite unfortunate that we have a, 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 what we call Putin. Putin happened to the world. The, the Ukrainian Rus Russian war happened. And then there was a general apathy. 
in the whole world. Okay. There was economic meltdown in the whole world. A lot of persons, we have poverty, we have unemployment across the world. Okay. What we are experiencing in Nigeria is not peculiar to Nigeria alone, but a global phenomenon. Okay. And but, that's what right. I think. Uh, but you share in this sentiment uh, as it relates to the key issues that will shape how the 2023 election will pan out. Uh, given the credentials, given the pedigrees of the respective candidates and their political parties, or are Nigerians better informed beyond the rhetorics of candidates and political parties in making their choices in 2023? What is going to be clear is that 2023 choice will be the people's choice. That should be clear. Now, Nigerians, if you have studied us to this point, have lost every form of interest in anything anybody is saying. They are only interested in what they are seeing. And what they are seeing right now is what affects them as a people. And it is going to shape, that's the major issue that is going to shape their ballot, if, if all other things being equal. Now, in 2023, these people that we have there, who are the three front uh, uh, runners, let us name them, Atiku Abubakar, uh, Bola Ahmed, Tinubu, and then Obi, have, have been exposed enough to the Nigerian populace that what we call their pedigrees are well known to the Nigerian people. Then the political equation as it is right now is also exposed enough to the Nigerian voters for people to know what direction the pendulum is swinging. So in 2023, what is going to affect voters is how does this two factor or all of this factor affect me as an individual? For instance, insecurity remains in the top burner of Nigerians. Whether it's Ahmed Tinubu or his party APC, Nigerians know that it was when the APC was in power in this past eight years that we have the heightened form of insecurity. You don't need the rhetorics to explain that to the woman in the village who has lost her husband to Fulani headers or Fulani uh, uh, terrorists in the forest. You don't need to explain that in Zamfara, where whole communities are paying tribute before they can go to their farms. You don't need to explain that in Niger State. You don't need to explain that in other parts of the north that are held under the vice grip of terrorism. You don't need to explain that in the South, that I heard on that device script of kidnapping. We know that a security, which is a plank, an arm of uh, the, the current government promise, for which we voted for them in 2016, has worsened, and we have the worst form of insecurity we have ever had in this country. Which means it has always been there. It, yes, it has always been there. The security should be there. Insecurity yeah. is in America. It's to the scale that we are speaking about. Okay. Now, when uh, Jonathan was there, so certain territories have been taken in the north. And the current government promised that when they come, they will not only secure those territories that have been taken in the north, they will end the security and drive the bandits away. Now we have a situation where if the government is finishing his own broadcast, one of the uh, bandit laws, and we now press now describe them as a bandit law. He's walking free. Television show him. Now we give his own press conference. Gumi has just told us that we should not vote for a president that, should, that will end the security. We should rather vote for a president that will tolerate terrorism and then see them as our brothers who are warriors fighting for us in the forest. Mm -hmm. And he said that on public television. Mm -hmm. So that tells you that insecurity has been accepted as a policy overtly or covertly by the present government. And that's why you have chieftains of insecurity speaking and giving their own national press conferences about insecurity and bandits and how they should be. So when you say it does so, not be accepted as a policy, yes. uh, that's not right. I said overtly. You know, over, you know over government is always you know, issuing uh, reports or statements okay, to it, denounce it, what it, they are doing. You didn't, so, you didn't hear my own yeah, I, I heard you loud I clear. said mm. Nigerians no longer believe anything you say. Mm. They believe what they are saying. Okay. So it doesn't matter how many times government comes to say it. Uh, but it's not it enough is, for you to say that government has now uh, made uh, insecurity as a policy uh, over in terms of, or covered. In, yes, in terms, of, in, terms not, in terms of not performing it, or dealing with the issue. That, that's not... That won't be correct. If uh, the, go if the yeah. government had dealt with the issue, would the government deny when we praise it for dealing with the issue? Mm. If the government had dealt with insecurity, I would come to television to say, we are praising this government for dealing with insecurity. The government will not say, don't give me the accolades. Okay. So the government has no moral justification to say, don't give me the blame. The blame rests squarely on then the box stops at the table of the commander-in-chief of the Air Force. Okay. Let me, so let me, right now in yeah, Nigeria, yeah. insecurity is going to shape voters' selection. Let, let me push you there, Chris. Uh, Dan, 
Um, you, you, you started by saying that the uh, things the electorate should consider, the pedigrees of those who are coming forth yeah. uh, to vie for elected position, especially at the presidential level. But let's, let's look at it this way. Let's look at it this way. Uh, 2023 just around the corner. Nigerians are fully aware of, of what the issues are in terms of the experiences in the last couple of years. Are you saying that Nigerians should just wash away or wish away all of these experiences and start focusing on the pedigrees of those who are, you know, vying for uh, elected position? Well, uh, sorry, Duke, I, what I said was that there was a global meltdown. Yes, so you're saying, listen, it, sir, a global listen, meltdown, listen. you're saying that Nigeria should not consider all of these effects. Yes, I global meltdown. So. Yeah. I have not said so. Okay. What Nigerians are, they should see what's before them. They should, they know what is before them. Mm. But there are things that they do not know that are overt or covert that they are not saying. Now, the issues are, we've had, from the inception of this country, we've had security matters. All sorts, all the governments that have been in place have had security issues. Like you said, it depends on the degree of the security issues. When it when Obasanjo was there, there was security issues. When uh, when uh, 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 the other the, the other president came, when Good Luck came, there were security issues. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons why Good Luck was voted out was because of security issues. So security issues are not novel. But what the populace do not know, I'm on the live TV. What the people do not know is the hand that shapes the government while the government is there. For instance, let me take your mind back. Oil was discovered in Nigeria in 1956 in Olo Oloibiri. And then the, the British were still in government. They were still in charge of this country. And then one question I would ask, what were the role played by the British as at the time that oil was discovered? They were still in charge of this country. And then they decided to hand over government to, you know, Nigerians. In 1960, we became a republic in 1963, all that you know. And then, there, was, there is today a euro dollar. Any country that does not sell, uh, sorry, euro, sorry, that, that does not sell petrol in dollars is seen as an enemy. When Saddam Hussein attempted to start to sell petrol in his own currency, he was brought down. When, 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 when Maman Gaddafi of Libya was trying to change, was trying to bring the dinner, dinner gold to be able to sell his, his petrol, he was killed. He was assassinated. And so the main issue, the burning issue that Nigerians are not saying is what happens to anybody, any leader who they say no to the petrol dollar. And in anybody, Nigeria is the largest economy, largest economy, largest the most populous black nation in the world. Mm. Anybody who wants to become president of Nigeria, there is an overt hand that controls a remote control. Well, exactly what point are you driving the at? The point now? I am driving at yeah. is this. Nigerians should begin to look at a president that can stand up against the overlords. Not just what you are saying now, because what you are saying now are after aftermath effects of those covert hands that is behind the scene. Controlling who becomes the president. Because every president that becomes a president in Africa must have a shortcoming. Isn't this book passing, by the way? I mean, what you're saying now, these analyses that you're giving. Isn't no, I don't passing? have to pack book. I don't have to pack the book. Mm -hmm. I'm stating the obvious. I'm stating what is a general thing in Africa. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to solve the problem, you should not start by saying President A did X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. President A, if given a free chance, he would have done better. Mm -hmm. And the Christ person, the problem of insecurity will not have arisen okay. in, the, in the first place. Okay. And then President B would not be able to if he comes in, because insecurity was the reason why good luck was voted out. And then when Buhari came on board, insecurity was heightened. Mm. And then people, not, if via the social media, we heard that there was a large quantity of, of uranium that was discovered in up north. Mm. It was discovered. And nobody has been able to say what happened to it, because there is an overlord. 
an overload. In Africa, there is a pressure that every African cannot, every African country cannot become independent, mm. cannot truly become independent to have control over what their strengths are. Because we are blessed in Africa. Okay. We have a lot of things in Africa. Okay, and so mm. I wish that our voters take time to look at the history of this country. Mm. And then, like I said, the pedigrees are, we already have a problem at hand. And those problems that we have, who are the persons that can stand up and face the problem head on? Head on? Is it a young man? Is it a middle-aged man? Is it a man? Or is it an old man? Okay, we have maybe who's an old man okay. because they are old. All the three, the three <laughs> candidates are old. Obi is 62 years old. Okay. Atiku is 74. Okay. And then uh, Bola Asumami is 70 years. Okay. And so they are all old. <laughs> okay. I don't know what I've said that is funny. They are old. <laughs> <laughs> and so all three of them could, anyone that Nigerians feel they want to vote for, mm. should be a man who can tackle the covert problem. The problem of the overlord. Why Nigerians can have control. For instance, we just discovered that there is an oil pipe, oil pipeline that was illegal. Yeah. And it didn't come during the Buhari regime. Mm. It's been there long before Buhari regime. Mm. You, will, you will recall that in 1979, Buhari had to national, nationalize a British petroleum. Mm. He had to. I think no Buhari. Uh, go, uh, um, Obasanjo, Obasanjo. Obasanjo had to nationalize, nationalize British petroleum. And then we now had African petroleum. These are things. What are the British doing? What do they want to achieve in Nigeria? What are so they you're, you're saying these foreign hands are responsible largely for the, for largely the, for the problems, problems of Africa and okay. indeed Nigeria. Nigeria. Okay, let, let me, do you share in this sentiment, Chris? Yeah. Uh, well, it's actually not a sentiment. It's mm. a reality okay. of uh, neocolonialism. Mm. But um, I must uh, also admit that it's a bit of buck passing at this moment. The reason is you have examples of those who have creatively beaten uh, this, you know, uh, in Africa, yes, in Africa, this uh, sold of Democrats, Ghana, for instance, and Rwanda, for instance, they are doing very well. And there are other little things you could do that affect the common man that do not have to be influenced by this international politics or mm -hmm. petrol dollars. So they, we, they are doing none in this regime. That's where the problem is. Now, before now, before this regime, we had regimes in Nigeria. I mean, since the days of 1960, we've had regimes. And our development in Western Nigeria, for instance, which I will have brought about, producing television, free education, free housing, and then agricultural economy. If we do that in this Nigeria of today, nobody's going to be complaining, and nobody's going to be interested in this international politics. It is when you begin to go into nuclear space and all of that, that you really get to have know, confrontations, so, yes, confrontations mm -hmm. with these people. Now, it also brings us back to the fact that what I talk about creative governance. If you don't have indigenous economy, you remain a slave. So we have remained the market. We are, I agree perfectly that if you look at the superstructure and the overall blame, you cannot put it squarely on one administration. But what has one administration done? Obasanjo was there and trusted the civilian government, eight years. I mean, we cannot say that it's the same kind of government we have today. Good Lord Jonathan was there. Umaru Yaradwa dealt with the Niger Delta issue. It did not have to do with what you had, what you, with uh, neocolonialism. I mean, he dealt with that. It's an internal problem. He dealt with that. We are saying, for instance, that insecurity, there is nowhere in the world the, inter the international governance do not support terrorism. They can support every other form of whatever, but terrorism, in fact, there are records that have shown that we have ways that we have blocked, and I mean, it's been the American journalists have come out to the public and so on and so forth. There are ways this government have blocked them from assisting, from helping. We, we, we acquired helicopters, Apache helicopters. What have they done? In fact, since we acquired those helicopters, terrorism has even grown worse. So the point is that we cannot deny that within ourselves, the sentiment that we find from above is a tolerance, a tacit acceptance. And that's because it is rooted in the ideology that is religious. It's rooted in the religious ideology. Unfortunately for all those in the helm of affairs, abide into that ideology. And so it's a monster that has gone out, even out of their own hands, the Frankenstein monster. It has gone out of their own hands. Nobody knows how to deal with it. So I agree with him. That's why as we are now approaching 2023, we are looking for that man who understands these issues, but also understands how to deal with it. And that's why I'm not following the reactionary path. Because the reactionary path where we create so much enemy and enmity within the country, and then we polarize even further, 
will not be able to solve the problem. So we are looking for somebody in the middle ground, so to speak, who can stretch out his hand this way, stretch out his hand this way, and you have a few people taking it, and then he will be able to scare us. Because we need a lot of wisdom in coming out of this. International influence is there. You can't take that away. You also have the other influences of within, sectional and secessional sentiments. Igbo was complaining the other day that he's surprised that the president has not reigned in Gumi. That was the boy that was chased out of Nigeria, almost killed, arrested in the Republic of Benin, put in jail, and so on. Why? Because he complained that in his own community, a Sariki Fulani is heading that community, and they are doing as they like. And he says he cannot sit down and take this. And so he went after him, and the man ran away to Quara. And the state sent out all the state machinery after a, a young boy that did not even get primary since, you know, a certificate. And the boy has come back now to say, Gumi has just come out to say this on public television. That Nigeria should vote for a tolerant, you know, uh, uh, a terrorist tolerant president. They should not vote for a president who wants to fight terrorism. And the man is walking about. The standards are there. So these are the problems that we have. So we need somebody who has been able to come out of himself and is magnanimous. And that's why we choose a unifier in the person of Atiku Abubakar. Okay. Abubakar has, you know, hands across the country. Whether you are coming from the angle of wives or coming from the angle of his pedigree as somebody who has worked with all walks of life with Ni of Nigerians, okay. or you are coming from the angle of the business sector, you know, he has that so he can reach out and yeah, be able I, to I, I will turn there, uh, I mean, caution yeah. us to um, okay. going on direct okay. campaigns because we don't have all our political parties represented yeah. here on this okay. platform. So yeah. focus on the issue. Uh, uh, Dan, uh, yeah. we, we just have some few minutes to call it a wrap on this uh, segment. Uh, in talking about the presidential candidates, I've heard people say over time, particularly in the last one year, that look, there has to be a paradigm shift in choosing who becomes Nigeria's next leader if we must make headway. Uh, some talk about uh, age as a factor. Some talk about intelligence as a factor. Some talk about the issues that are coming forth even from the presidential uh, candidates, in terms of addressing the key issues of governance. I I'd like you to talk along those lines, because one major thing you brought forth is that we need to look at pedigree, all right? We looked at pedigree uh, in 2015. This is where pedigree has taken, to, uh, taken us to now. And you're also asking us to look at pedigree again in 2023. I don't know if um, how you can reconcile these two extremes. Well, well, I'd like to take you on the word paradigm shift. And now, uh, Buhari is from, is, from, is from the north. He has ruled for eight years. As a matter of fact, Buhari is not just from the north. Buhari is a full animal. And then when you talk about a unifier, it is the tone of the southerners. It is our tone. Because in section seven of the PDP constitution, it states clearly, there shall be a zoning. And then there is a violation of that section seven of the PDP constitution. And then power cannot ever, should not, because it would, it would, it would destabilize this country. And we have heightened insecurity because a full animal cannot hand over to another full animal. And that completely erase and cancel the party flag bearer of PDP because firstly is in violation of section 7 of, of PDP constitution and then is in violation of the of the gentlemanly agreement that power shall rotate within Nigeria. He is he is desperate and desperations are negative words. And so I wish that Atiku Abubakar will all due respect to the his excellency Atiku Abubakar. But he has, he has his right to seek for election. No, he has his right. He's, so he going, has against, so he's going we, against we the gentleman. You can't take that right from him. You can't take that right from him. Just yeah. like in 2015, in 2015, uh, sorry, Good Lord Jonathan had the right to, to, to contest. He was, he, was, he was cashing in on that right mm. when everybody said it is the turn of the north. And so we are saying, I'm in total agreement with Wiki that it is the turn of the southerner. I think Africa has no, has no reason. It should be southerners. All party flag bearers should be southerners. And so when he violated that, he is not a unifier. He's a destroyer. Sorry to, to use that word. He wants to cause apathy 
and disharmony within the country. Mm -hmm. The gentlemanly agreement is going against it. And that's being said, that is for that. Now, coming home to those who are party flag bearers, I wish that we do not be sentimental, you know, about the state. We should look at issues. The president of America became president when he was 77 years old. And America is the largest economy in the world. If the Americans, in all their political awareness, could vote for a man who is 77 years old, I don't know why Nigerians are whipping up sympathy about age. At Asiwaju Bola Metunubu was XY governor of Lagos State. And he took Lagos to become the fifth, the fifth largest economy in 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 the in in, 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 in Africa. From 600,000, 600, uh, uh, 600, you know, monthly internet generated revenue to six billion internet generated revenue. And then the man is a mild as touch. Okay. Everything so, he touches turn, yeah. turn, turn, so, turn so to go. I, I, I just need to, I just need the final word from uh, you, uh, as we call it to wrap in terms of your expectations on the elections. Yeah, my, my expectations, like I've said, mm. Nigerians should not look at the current issues because they are global phenomena. Okay. They should look at the pedigrees of the various candidates okay. right. and how unifier unifying the, the, the right. Chris, first, 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 first I'd like to thank Dan. He seemed to be very passionate about PDP. <laughs> I <laughs> thought you said he was an APC chief. No, no, I mean, he, he, he has been half he, of the time talking about our party. Yeah, because, because <laughs> of what your party he has done. He said he supports Wiki. Mm. Are you sure he's not a PDP member? <laughs> 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 All right, that's on the lighter side. I, I do. Uh, yeah. Now, I, I expect that the Nigerians who have already made their choice, I mean, as events are unfolding, we are seeing that choice should stay true to keeping this country as one. We don't want people who are reactionary who will begin another round of sectional politics. And we also don't want people who don't have all parts of Nigeria represented in the presidency. For instance, the Christian community is not represented in the APC ticket. And uh, you cannot have such a huge community which goes across South and North. You know, and then you are saying that uh, uh, somebody who is from the North this one has denied both north and south. There are Christians in the north and there are Christians in the south. There are Christians all over Nigeria. It's not represented in the presidency. So if you are going to discuss in the Federal Executive Council, who is going to be representing the presidency? Who is going to be representing that section of okay. the second largest religion in, in Nigeria? Okay. You know, so, it's, so it's not represented. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, if we have more time, I'd probably love to talk with you. But definitely, as uh, events unfold, we'll be having you guys here to... Uh, engage some of these issues the more. Uh, remember, the election is going to be coming up. It's coming up uh, next month, February uh, 25, presidential election. And so uh, we put our fingers crossed and see how things pan out. Daniel Hiller, thank you for coming. Uh, Christopher Jacob, thank you for thank coming. You. It's the TMI, beautiful Monday morning.